All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we are going to be brewing an Italian Pilsner. And before you ask, no, that's not Peroni. It's not even close. Keep watching to find out why. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome. Thanks for checking out the channel. Here on this channel, I'll typically do a grain to glass video like the one you're watching right now, or I'll do shorter, more uh, topical type of homebrewing videos as well on the off weeks. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button and like this video so that you get to see more of this content more frequently. Today, we are working on video number four in my Pilsner series. Today, we are doing the Italian Pilsner. This is uh, actually a long-requested style ever since I started the Pilsner series. I figured people were going to want to see this one. Um, it is probably one of the newest styles of Pilsner that has emerged uh, in the world. It's a new world take on an old world style and is a beer that has kind of spurred on some pretty impressive uh, offshoots of the Pilsner style in the form of Italian Pilsner. Effectively, Italian Pilsner began with a beer called Tipo Pils. This beer was made by a small brewery in northern Italy called Birificio Italiano. In making Tipo Pils, uh, this brewery unintentionally invented the brand new style of Italian Pilsner. Essentially what they were going for was the feel of a brand new, super fresh Keller Pils in the German style. Uh, Keller Pils is basically a Keller beer version of a German Pilsner. What that means is it's a very young lager. It still has yeast in suspension. With a Keller Pils though, you get a lot more fresh hop character than you do with other types of Keller beers. Simply because there's a lot more hops added during the brewing process of a Pilsner than other types of European lagers. At its core, an Italian Pilsner was simply a German Pils at its base that was then dry hopped with New World European hops. And this creates a completely different beer. You may find a couple other kinds of Italian Pilsners uh, out there. One of the other ones is Pivo Pils by Firestone. In some cases, you may find these represented as dry hopped Pilsners. And it's basically the same concept. If it's been, if it's been dry hopped with European hops, it's probably going to be an Italian Pilsner. This extra step of dry hopping adds a new layer of complexity to the already well-established uh, excellence of the Pilsner style. So after doing an extensive amount of research on the internet, I've kind of come up with a decent recipe, I would think, for the Italian Pilsner. In fact, we are kind of lucky in that the brewer of Tipo Pils has actually gone on record saying some of the ingredients that he uses and some of the processes that he uses in the brewing of Tipo Pils. I'm going to link an article in the description that kind of goes over some of that stuff if you're curious about reading more about it. Essentially what we're going for here is a softer, slightly maltier version of a German Pilsner that's been brewed with New World hops to a little bit more aggressive level of bitterness than your typical German Pilsner. And then on top of that, we're gonna add that dry hopping step. The effect of this should be the beer that has the crispness and the drinkability of a Pilsner while having a small amount of malt complexity yet still having hop character that goes above and beyond that of your typical German Pilsner. So either an extra level of complexity or just even more in your face hoppiness. That being said, we should still not go overboard. We need to keep sight of the fact that this is at its core a Pilsner. It's not an IPA. It's not an IPL either. We need to preserve the delicateness of this while still adding a tremendous amount of hops, and it's very, very easy to knock that balance out of whack. I'm really curious to see how this goes. I've never brewed one of these before, um, but I've heard so much about them, and I've had a couple really good examples that really uh, inspired me to actually take this step. And actually, this beer is the whole reason I went down the whole Pilsner series route <laughs> in the first place. So it took us three beers to get here, and now this is our fourth. I'm really hoping I could do it justice because this is indeed one of the coolest beer styles that is out there right now. Before we get into the recipe though, I would like to thank Northern Brewer for providing the ingredients that I needed for this batch. Northern Brewer should really be your first stop when you're thinking about getting the ingredients for your next batch of beer or picking up a new piece of equipment for home brewing. They have a fantastic selection of top of the line equipment and fantastic home brewing ingredients. And they have been in business for almost 28 years. So they really are a fantastic resource of knowledge as well. Northern Brewer used to be owned by AB InBev, but that has now changed. And I would like to inform you if you haven't heard already that they are not owned by AB InBev anymore. They really are a fantastic company and I would highly encourage you to check out what they have to offer before making the decisions for your next batch of beer. 
All right, so onto the recipe section now. So we're gonna start out with about 10 pounds of Weyermann Bark Pilsner Malt. Uh, this is their higher grade quality of Pilsner malt. Uh, supposedly, Bark Pilsner has a much higher uh, level of maltiness and complexity to it, so it should be very interesting to see how that manifests itself in this beer. And then we're adding an ingredient that was actually specifically identified by the brewer of Tipo Pils, uh, a quarter pound of Caramunic 1. Uh, so it should be interesting to see what this does to the beer. I'm guessing it's going to darken it slightly, but it's also going to add a little tiny bit of sweetness, maybe just enough to balance out the extra level of hopping in there. Um, it should be interesting to see what that does. For hops, we are going to do a first wort hopping addition with one ounce of pearl. Um, the pearl that I got is oddly low in alpha acids. It's like 5.3%. Uh, typically, I've seen pearl around the 8% mark. However, that shouldn't really affect the overall impact that the pearl has. So, like I said, we're doing one ounce of pearl at first word hops, then we're gonna do one ounce of pearl at 15 minutes. And then we're gonna add one ounce of sapphire at zero minutes. Sapphire is one of the New World German hops. Sapphire is another one of those ingredients that was directly mentioned by the brewer of Tipa Pills. And then, of course, the all-important dry hop. We're gonna actually dry hop this one in the middle of primary fermentation. I was not aware that biotransformation could actually occur with lager yeast. Um, however, we're gonna give it a shot and see what happens because the brewer definitely recommended adding dry hops during primary fermentation for that specific reason. We're gonna add an ounce and a half of sapphire as dry hops. Um, we're gonna dry hop for about five days and we're gonna do it about three days into the actual fermentation. For our yeast, we're gonna use the good old standby of Saf Lager W3470 dry lager yeast fermented at a relatively warm temperature. Uh, this is something I'm gonna talk more about during the fermentation segment, but uh, this is yet another way to ferment a lager using the dry yeast and this particular strain of yeast at a higher temperature. For the water profile, this beer is specifically mentioned as being very soft. So in order to get a very soft mouthfeel, one of the best ways to do that is to use a very soft water profile. So I'm going to be using the same water profile that I used in my Czech Pilsner. It really helps to actually have proof of how that impacts a beer. So this is gonna be our water profile. We're doing 12 parts per million of calcium, three parts per million of magnesium, nine parts per million of sodium, 21 parts per million of chloride, 13 parts per million of sulfate, and 23 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'll be starting with distilled water and adding one gram each of Epsom, calcium chloride, and sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. That should really get us a very soft and delicate water profile that'll preserve a lot of delicate and intricate flavors that we're gonna get out of this beer style. And lastly, for the mash, we're gonna do a very standard mash, uh, 152 degrees Fahrenheit single infusion for about 60 minutes. That should get us uh, everything we need for this particular beer. And it should give us a relatively uh, good balance between a highly fermentable wort and a wort that retains a little bit of sweetness. Anyway, our mash water is all up to temperature right now, so let's go ahead and dough in. Once the strike water in my Clawhammer Supply 120 volt system reached my mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash. And I had a lot because the crush on this particular malt was very powdery. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes and then I took a pH measurement and I saw a hot pH that was actually well north of 6, so I immediately added about a cap full of lactic acid. This brought the pH down to a correct 5.4. Then I let the mash sit at 152 Fahrenheit for about 60 minutes. Then I raised to my mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes. And then I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain. I actually had to deal with the very first stuck mash I've ever experienced using a brew in a bag system. So I Attempted to mix some rice hulls into the grist and that sort of fixed it and allowed it to water a bit better But that came obviously at the cost of upsetting the grain bed um, And not getting a clear wort Once the water was underway though I did set the controller to 100% power to get a head start on the boil and then I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and I recorded a measurement of 11.5 bricks or 1045 This was actually three points higher than my estimated target pre-boil gravity as soon as I removed the grain basket, I added my first wort hops. That was one ounce of pearl. Once I reached the boil, nothing happened for 45 minutes. 
15 minutes from the end, I added my 15 minute hop addition. That was another one ounce of pearl. And then I also added a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. And I began recirculating boiling wort through my chiller in order to sanitize it. Uh, this is just the easiest and quickest way to ensure that your chilling equipment is sanitary on the inside. Then 15 minutes later, I killed the heat and I added my zero minute hop addition, one ounce of sapphire. At this point, I began to chill to about 70 Fahrenheit. And then once I was transferred into the fermenter, I aerated with pure oxygen. Uh, with a dose of about one minute at full blast. At this point, I pitched my yeast. I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 12.8 bricks or 1051, which was right on target. All right, let's talk about the fermentation on this beer. So first of all, we're gonna be using probably my favorite lager yeast and probably the easiest lager yeast to use out of them all, that Saf Lager W3470 dry lager yeast. It's awesome to have dry lager yeast like that because it really cuts down on the amount of preparation you have to do prior to pitching your yeast, and it also gives you a really good cell count. But we're gonna do something different with this lager yeast than we've done in the past several Pilsner videos and that is fermenting it at a slightly warmer temperature than usual. W3470 has a huge range in uh, terms of fermentation temperature that it can handle and will produce a clean beer uh, when fermented at those temperatures. All the way from about the low 50s up to the, um, if you really want to push it, the high 60s. Um, I would not really recommend going above 70 degrees for this particular type of yeast, however, what we are doing today is trying to push a little bit more fruitiness out of this yeast. So we are actually, in fact, going to ferment with W3470 at about 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the upper end of its range, and this should do some pretty cool stuff. However, there are many other ways you can ferment this particular type of beer. If you want to use a different type of lager yeast, there's many options available to you. Something like Y Yeast 2124 Bohemian Lager, or if you're using Imperial yeast, then I'd go for Imperial Global, or if you are okay with a little bit extra kind of roundness and diacetyl, maybe Harvest uh, would be good for you. Of course, if you want to push this to a higher temperature and you don't want to use lager yeast, there is absolutely nothing wrong with using Lutroquark by Omega Yeast. Um, that's another great clean fermenting yeast uh, that you can use um, at very high temperatures. In fact, if you have a heat blanket, you can push this all the way up to 95, even 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and you'll have your beer done in like three or four days if you do that. This is a beer that would definitely benefit from being pressure fermented. Um, it's a beer that you want to have a lot of hop aroma in. So if you pressure ferment this, you're going to lock in a lot of those extra uh, aromas from the dry hopping step. And you're also going to give yourself a little bit faster of a fermentation, especially if you're still using lager yeast and you start, start to uh, ramp it up to that higher temperature. I'm going to be using my Spike CF5 for this. I'm not going to be fermenting under any pressure, but understand there is no requirement to use any sort of fancy equipment on this. Um, this is a great beer to make in a firm Zilla all-rounder or even in a bucket. The only tricky thing about this fermentation is keeping it, if you can, under 70 degrees and uh, ensuring that you get a good dry hopping step in there. Because that dry hopping is occurring during the first phase of fermentation, during the active fermentation, you actually don't have to worry about oxidation. Uh, when you add your dry hops in because the beer is still actively fermenting it's pushing out co2 if you drag in any oxygen it will be consumed by the yeast and turned into co2 so you don't have to worry about that very much unlike other types of beers where you're dry hopping after the primary fermentation and then the beer is vulnerable to oxidation anyway just to recap i will be using w3470 and i will be fermenting it warm uh, without any added pressure at about 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit for probably about five to seven days. Typically, uh, W3470 tends to absolutely just rip through fermentation at the, uh, the high temperatures that we're giving it this time. Um, so it should actually be done pretty quickly. I'm gonna add my ounce and a half of sapphire as a dry hop on about day three. I'm gonna let the dry hops sit on the beer for about five days and then I will pull them out and probably transfer on the same day into a package where I'll add gelatin finings to the beer to speed up the clarification process and get it on gas as soon as possible. This is a beer that I do kind of want to preserve the hop aroma in, so I will have zero issues serving it in a Keller Pills state as that's kind of what it was intended to do in the first place. And that's really all there is to it, so I will catch you guys in a couple weeks. Final gravity on the Italian Pilsner ended up at a pretty nice, somewhat dry 10.09.
So fermentation with the Italian Pilsner actually ended up going pretty well. Honestly, it was very fast. Uh, as was to be expected when using W3470 at a high temperature. I fermented according to the plan, and then on day three, I added my ounce and a half of Saphir dry hops loose. Considering it was not a large amount of dry hops relative to the beer, it's gonna be fine to let those just sit in there loose. It's not gonna clog anything up unless you're incredibly unlucky. Uh, so I let it sit in the beer for about five days, and then I just close transferred the beer into a keg and I let that condition about two or three days at room temperature for a diacetyl rest because yes, I did detect a small amount of diacetyl when I tasted the beer on the transfer. After two or three days on the diacetyl rest in the keg, I put it in the keezer and then I added some gelatin to the keg. I let that sit and condition for about two or three more days. And then uh, now we're here at the point where we can taste the beer. It is a delicious beer and probably my favorite Pilsner of this whole thing so far. I am having so much fun with this Pilsner series because every single one is so different. And this is just another example. So without further ado, let's go ahead and pour it. Okay, so the beer is called Senor Vespa and it comes in at 5.5% ABV and 35 IBUs. So for the appearance of the beer, we are looking at a just ever so slightly hazy, pale gold color, uh, and a nice fluffy white head that disappears rather quickly, but does leave a nice layer on the surface uh, that sticks around and stays in place. Now, let's go ahead and talk about aroma. I just snorted beer. <laughs> oh, that's weird. There's a really robust graininess in this and just a nice kind of, I don't know, there's a richness in the aroma um, in terms of malt, actually. As far as hops go, there's a bit of a sweet kind of herbal character and that's about it. So moving in towards mouthfeel on this one. The mouthfeel on this one is absolutely right where I wanted it to be. It is a nice, soft, just gentle, delicate mouthfeel. It has a really nice light body as well. This is a supremely soft beer that also retains a good amount of drinkability overall. It's a super delicate and pleasant mouthfeel that I really, really enjoy. So last but certainly not least, let's go in for flavor. Mmm. This is absolutely delicious. Every single Pilsner I've made in this series so far has absolutely blown my mind, and this one is <laughs> no exception. Um, they're all individually unique, and they're all different. This Italian Pilsner is just on a completely different level than the German and the Czech and the American Pilsner. The thing that is so different about this particular beer when compared to the other three is just simply the uh, floral character of the hops. It's most prevalent in the flavor, I think, uh, but it's just super floral in character. It's as if somebody just dumped petals of flowers into the beer and it ended up manifesting itself in the, the flavor and the aroma. It's really quite unique. There's also a bit of a light berry character going on as well. I'm not really sure exactly what kind of berry we're talking about here, um, but it's a sort of subtle fruitiness that I can't quite put a finger on. There's a subtle spice in there as well. Not quite sure what it is, but it's like somewhere between mint and lavender. Um, that's as best as I can do right now. <laughs> it's a really interesting blend between the European styles that we already have and then just layering new school hops on top of that. I think another thing that makes this actually really um, showcase the hops in such a good way is that there is a small amount of background sweetness. And that is coming from the Caramunic malt, which is not something I've used to date uh, in, in any of the Pilsner recipes. Uh, but Caramunic is having a residual sweetness to this beer that kind of makes it feel like it's a sweet cracker, sweet biscuit kind of thing. There's kind of a slight background note of caramel in this, uh, and it's not too offensive, but this subtle addition of sweetness allows the beer to shine a little bit more with the hops um, because it gives them, ironically, some sweetness to actually be uh, detected against. I think it's a really good balance of sweetness in hop character. The bitterness in this style is very smooth and gentle. Um, you almost don't even know it's there. At the end of the day, there is absolutely nothing I would change about this recipe. It's that good. 
I really do think that you should try this out if you can. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please hit that subscribe button, and ultimately, if you learned something, please hit that like button as well, so I know. Uh, this is a beer that is well worth brewing, and if you did, please comment down below and let me know how you did it. If you want to support the channel, there's a variety of ways to do so. First and foremost, I have a merchandise store down below the description box where you can find this t-shirt as well as many others like it. And if you want to support the channel on a more personal basis, there is also a Patreon, which is linked in the description box as well. And uh, thank you very much to my current Patreon supporters. You guys are doing amazing things for this channel, and I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now without you. Last but certainly not least, if you happen to be in the market for some homebrewing equipment, I have a variety of different things that I highly recommend personally that are in my Amazon store, which you will find linked in the description box as well. Every single thing on that store I personally vouch for and have used multiple times myself. If you want to follow me on more social media than just YouTube, uh, check out my Instagram, which is at the apartment brewer on Instagram. I'll uh, post there a little bit more frequently than I do here on YouTube. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. Um, you are my true fans, and I really do appreciate you guys so much. So until the next one, cheers.